Port Comfort. Ironically, that was the name of the first port of entry for enslaved Africans in what would become the United States of America. The year was 1619. Approximately 20 Africans were traded for food by pirates and later sold to Jamestown settlers as servants. However, their arrival in Jamestown had been unlike the arrival of any servants that preceded them. Shackled, they began as a group of almost 600, forcibly marched from the interior of Africa to the coast and sold to Portuguese slave traders. Only 350 survived the march. During their voyage across the Atlantic, they were chained together by the neck and legs in a cramped space under the ship's deck, unable to turn and struggling to breathe. Almost half of them died. Physically and psychologically traumatized, their arrival would mark the beginning of African slavery in the future United States of America. Why was slave labor so desired in Jamestown? Its settlers were desperate and feared starvation. Funded by investors, they also needed to generate profits. A stable labor of English indentured servants and enslaved Africans could kill two birds with one stone. Fearing the possibility of labor revolts if the two groups joined forces, legislation forbid any fraternization or intermarriage between indentured servants and enslaved Africans. Interracial marriage ban laws in Virginia and 15 other states would last until the Supreme Court struck them down in 1967. When former indentured servant Nathaniel Bacon led a violent revolt in Virginia with a thousand other indentured servants, he unintentionally made slavery the preferred labor system of the South. The Virginia governor crushed the revolt, but he and other Southern royal officials looked for less troublesome workers. Slave populations grew dramatically in the decades that followed. Enslaved Africans made up half the population in Virginia and outnumbered whites in South Carolina two to one. An inhumane slave code was enacted to control rising slave populations. Hypocritically, at the same time colonists began clamoring for natural rights and freedom from Great Britain, they deprived enslaved Africans of freedom and their natural rights. Even slaveholder Thomas Jefferson was critical of what he called the abominable crime of slavery in his original draft of the Declaration of Independence. His words sparked intense debate and were stricken from the Declaration. Thus words, all men are created equal, applied only to white men. It's no wonder that nearly 20,000 slaves joined Britain's side in the Revolutionary War. Nearly 3,000 ex-slaves that served in the British Army left the nation as free men. Among them was Henry Washington, ex-slave of future President George Washington. Although slavery continued to grow exponentially in the South after the Revolutionary War, it was not confined to the South. With less of a need for slave labor, all northern states passed laws abolishing slavery by 1804. The abolitionist movement began to grow as a national reform fervor swept the nation in the 1830s and 1840s. Escaped slave Sojourner Truth illuminated the intersectionality of the women's suffrage and the abolitionist reform movements by posing a simple question, ain't I a woman? Abolitionism also bloomed at the same time preacher slave Nat Turner led a slave revolt. As Americans moved westward, they clashed about whether new territories should be slave or free states. A series of compromises became nothing but a band-aid for the gaping wound slavery had caused in American society. It wasn't until the horrors of slavery were exposed and brought into American homes by a petite mother of six named Harriet Beecher Stowe that it became impossible for Americans to turn a blind eye to the inhumanity of slavery. Stowe's novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, caused Americans to demand change. Upon being introduced, President Lincoln said to Stowe, so you're the little woman who wrote that book that made this great war. He wasn't wrong. 
The Civil War raged from 1861 to 1865. Approximately 180,000 African Americans served in the Union Army during the Civil War, comprising 10% of Union forces. While the 54th Massachusetts Regiment is likely the most notable one, other black regiments formed and fought as well. Harriet Tubman led a military raid that disrupted Confederate supplies and freed nearly 800 slaves. When the Civil War ended, freedom for all slaves was granted with the passage of the 13th Amendment, and the 14th and 15th Amendments would grant them equal protection under the law and voting rights for men. Unfortunately, passing amendments doesn't necessarily create societal change. A hollow victory for racial justice was won in the Civil War. One system of racial oppression replaced another as the institution of slavery was replaced by powerfully oppressive black codes and Jim Crow laws. Reconstructing the United States after the Civil War would no doubt be an arduous task. That task was complicated by the fact that President Lincoln was assassinated just five days after General Lee surrendered. Even more problematic was the fact that the man entrusted to carry out Reconstruction had served as Vice President a mere six weeks at the time of Lincoln's assassination. Lincoln selected Andrew Johnson as his running mate to ensure border states would not secede from the Union and join the Confederacy. So when Johnson, a slaveholder with Southern sympathies, led the nation during Reconstruction, it proved to be problematic for Southern African Americans. President Johnson failed to enforce the laws intended to protect Southern Blacks, allowing them to be terrorized by the Ku Klux Klan and methodically bound to a subservient status. Black codes imprisoned newly freed Blacks for reasons such as homelessness or for being uppity. They also forced Blacks to sign yearly labor contracts, often leaving newly freed slaves to work for their former masters as sharecroppers and forbid them from holding other jobs. Little had changed for Southern Blacks from their days of slavery. Would former slaves have fared better under different presidential leadership? The answer is unequivocally yes. When President Grant took office after Johnson, he executed the laws of the country and used the military to protect African American rights. The result? He suppressed the Ku Klux Klan. African Americans in the South were able to vote, serve on juries, and hold political office. An estimated 1,500 African Americans held local and state political offices during this time period. So what could go wrong for African Americans on a new trajectory of success? Unfortunately, the presidential election of 1876 disrupted that trajectory. When neither Republican Hayes nor Democrat Tilden won a majority of the Electoral College votes, a commission was formed to determine the election's outcome. A compromise was reached in which the Republican Party agreed to abandon its pursuit of racial equality and end military occupation of the South to win the presidential election. Now no one was left to enforce legislation that protected the rights of African Americans. If that weren't bad enough, the Supreme Court declared in its Plessy v. Ferguson decision, racial segregation was constitutional under the separate but equal doctrine. African Americans entered the 20th century without presidential, congressional, or Supreme Court support. No one was on their side. The Ku Klux Klan surged with a vengeance, resulting in well over 700 public lynchings from 1882 to 1940. Even when African Americans tried to escape the oppression of the South by migrating to the North, they found little comfort or welcome there. Over 380,000 African American men served in segregated troops during World War I. President Woodrow Wilson proclaimed the world must be made safe for democracy, yet hypocritically believed in white supremacy. What awaited the black veterans who heroically risked their lives in World War I? Certainly not an America safe for democracy. Race riots broke out in many cities in the red summer of 1919. One of the worst racial violence incidents in our nation's history occurred in Tulsa, Oklahoma, when a black teenager was accused of sexually assaulting 
a white female elevator operator. Tensions grew between whites and blacks, culminating in thousands of whites looting and burning the African-American homes and businesses of the financially bustling neighborhood known as Black Wall Street. An estimated 100 to 300 people were killed and 8,000 were left homeless. The police later determined the black teen had merely tripped and fell into the elevator operator. More than 700 Confederate monuments were erected in city squares across the nation from 1890 to 1950. Their intention? To intimidate and terrify African Americans. The majority still stand today. World War II didn't change much for the 1.2 million African Americans who risked their lives to serve as segregated troops. The double victory black soldiers hoped to achieve over dictators abroad and racism at home didn't happen. Not even for the famous Tuskegee Airmen who overcame significant obstacles and prejudice to fly combat aircrafts. Although the U.S. Armed Forces were officially desegregated by President Truman in 1948, black veterans returned to the same Jim Crow South and racially charged North. So how could a civil rights movement evolve in such a climate? When the Supreme Court ruled that racially segregated public schools were unconstitutional and inherently unequal in the 1954 Brown v. Board of Education case, it overturned the nearly 60-year-old precedent established by Plessy v. Ferguson. The decision was bold and unanimous. The court's decision was enforced by President Eisenhower, who sent federal troops to support school desegregation efforts and maintain order. While the Brown v. Board of Education case may have nudged the nation toward a civil rights movement, it was reactions to it that ultimately sparked the movement. A year after Brown, 14-year-old Emmett Till was murdered for whistling at white store owner Carolyn Bryant. Bryant's husband Roy and brother-in-law J.W. Millam responded by kidnapping Till, mercilessly beating him, gouging out his eyes, cutting off his tongue, ear, and genitals, and shooting him in the head. With barbed wire, they tied a 75-pound cotton gin fan to his naked body and threw him in the Tallahatchie River. Till's mother insisted on an open casket funeral so the world could see what racist murderers had done to her son. Pictures of Till, wholly unrecognizable, beaten and disfigured, made their way into mainstream media and the homes of black and white Americans alike, sending shockwaves through the nation. Americans became witnesses to the murder of a child. Roy Bryant and J.W. Millam were acquitted of all wrongdoing by an all-white male jury, but confessed to Till's murder a year later. Carolyn Bryant would later admit that her testimony of Till grabbing her by the waist and making rude comments to her was a lie. Emmett Till's own father, Lewis, was found guilty of rape and murder despite victims being unable to identify him while serving in World War II. The U.S. military executed him by hanging. As a child, and with abject brutality, Emmett Till met the same fate as his father. Like the effect of Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, the horrific murder of Emmett Till caused Americans to demand change. The Civil Rights Movement gained momentum with desegregation and voting rights as its early goals. While desegregation efforts led to some victories, Desegregating public facilities in Birmingham, Alabama was harder to achieve. Enduring violence, a thousand African-American children marched and protested under the leadership of Dr. Martin Luther King. Their efforts succeeded in desegregating the lunch counters, water fountains, and bathrooms of Birmingham, but success was not without a high cost. The Ku Klux Klan retaliated by bombing the Baptist Church in Birmingham where the protests were planned and in doing so, killed four young African-American girls. The efforts of Dr. King and other civil rights leaders and protesters led to the passage of key legislation, but not without more sacrifices. Police brutally beat and tear-gassed voting rights protesters crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge 
just a few months before the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was signed into law. Unfortunately, racial discrimination continued in employment and housing opportunities. The frustration of African Americans rose as multiple systems of oppression worked against them. Many looked for leadership that felt more empowering. Leaders like Malcolm X and the Black Panther Party gained prominence. Every case of police brutality against a Negro follows the same pattern. They attack you, bust you all upside your mouth, and then take you to court and charge you with assault. What kind of democracy is that? What kind of uh, freedom is that? What kind of social or political system is it when a black man has no voice in court? Right. has no nothing on his side other than what the white man right. chooses to give him. But somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly. Somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Somewhere I read of the freedom of press. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest far right. seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I think uh, sad news for all of our fellow citizens and people who love peace all over the world. And that is that Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight in Memphis, Tennessee. The assassinations of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King confirmed what history had taught African Americans many times before. Those that dare stand up to white oppression will pay a heavy price. Uprisings and riots against police brutality and in reaction to Dr. King's assassination erupted in cities across the nation. Hundreds died, thousands were injured. The civil rights movement hadn't resolved all issues of racial inequality and injustice. President Johnson charged the Kerner Commission with the task of finding the root cause of the nearly 150 riots in African American communities from 1965 to 1968. Johnson handpicked moderate commission members and expected them to report that angry black men were the cause of the riots. The Kerner Commission determined that it was in fact white racism, not black anger, that was to blame. The Kerner Commission specifically identified a combination of police brutality, a flawed justice system, poor and inadequate housing, high unemployment, voter suppression, and systematically embedded forms of racial discrimination and oppression as the causes of violent upheaval, the Kerner Commission panel reported, white society is deeply implicated in the ghetto. White institutions created it, white institutions maintain it, and white society condones it. Aggressive government spending to promote equal opportunities to African Americans was the recommendation of the Kerner Commission. This won the praise of African-American leaders, but not President Johnson, Congress, or the majority of white Americans. The Kerner Commission's recommendations were ignored. And what was to come of the systems of racial oppression identified by the commission? They would be strengthened and reformulated into new legislation, leading to the next system of racial oppression to be unleashed on African-Americans. Law and order. Law and order. Law and order. Law and order. Fearful of the black power movement and unsettled by images of violent upheaval in black ghettos, many white Americans were primed to support the law and order rhetoric of President Nixon. Law and order would usher in a half century of policies that have debilitated and devastated African American communities across the nation. Presidents Nixon, Reagan, Clinton and Trump, and Republican and Democratic congressional leaders have supported law and order policies. What has been the result? The mass incarceration of African Americans 
and the unequal doling of justice in our criminal penal system. In her documentary 13th, filmmaker Ava DuVernay chronicles the exponential growth of the U.S. prison population Despite making up only 6.5% of the population, black men constitute 40.2% of the U.S. prison population. Whereas only 1 in 17 white men is likely to be imprisoned at some point in their lifetime, 1 in 3 black men is likely to be imprisoned. In most states, these men lose their right to vote while incarcerated or on probation. In some states, they lose their right to vote permanently. Once thought to be civil rights victories, voting rights remain battlefronts. African Americans are forced to fight. The vast majority of prison inmates are serving sentences for drug offenses, not violent crimes. Presently, 10.6% of prison inmates are incarcerated for sexual offenses and 3.2% for homicide, aggravated assault, and kidnapping combined. So if most prison inmates are serving time for drug offenses and most prison inmates are black men, then the likely assumption would be that most drug crimes are committed by black men, right? In the 1980s, whites were 45% more likely to sell drugs than blacks. In 2012, whites between the ages of 12 and 25 sold drugs at 32% higher rates than their black counterparts. Statistically, a black man will receive a 20% longer prison sentence than a white man for the same crime. That doesn't even take into account that African Americans are so fearful of the punishments they might receive, they plea bargain or confess to crimes they didn't even commit. In 1989, a 28-year-old white woman was raped and brutally beaten in Central Park. Coerced and interrogated by detectives without their parents or lawyers present, Five black and brown teens between the ages of 14 and 16 confessed to the crime. They later recanted their confessions, but were found guilty when they stood trial and went to prison nonetheless. It wasn't until the actual Central Park jogger rapist confessed to the crime in 2001 that the boys, now men, were finally exonerated. The law and order system of racial oppression has devastated African Americans by targeting them mass incarcerating them, and applying uneven justice every step of the way. Today, African Americans are three times more likely to be killed by police than whites. Eric Gardner said he was tired of being harassed by the police. This is way hard way for what? Every time you see me, you want to mess with me. I'm tired of it. It stops today. Every time you see me, you want to harass me. You want to stop me. You want to tell me I'm minding my business, officer. I'm minding my business. Please just leave me alone. I told you the last time. Please just leave me alone. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't, don't, don't touch me, please. Came over. Don't touch me. Damn. Come on, Ricky. Put your hand behind your back. Put Eric Garner died of complications from an asthmatic attack because as he clearly stated, he couldn't breathe. None of the officers faced criminal or civil charges in connection to Garner's death. Garner's alleged crime? Selling single cigarettes from a pack without tax stamps. Over a hundred African Americans have died at the hands of police officers since the time of Eric Garner's death. Some doing nothing more than sitting on their couch watching TVs, playing with a toy in the park, or sleeping in their own bed. Much like the words of Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin expose the inhumanity of slavery, or the images of Emmett Till's grotesquely mutilated murdered body expose the horrors of Jim Crow. Cell phone footage captured the killing of African-American George Floyd and exposed the racial reality of police brutality. Get up, get in the car. I can't move. I've been waiting the whole time. (laughs) Get up, get in the car. Mama. Get up and get in the car right. I can't. You can't get y'all the opportunity to get in, bro. I told you, you can't win. My knee. 
You can't win, man. I'm through. I know you're in there, you didn't listen. Uh, that's the fool. My stomach hurts. Uh -huh. My neck hurts. Uh -huh. Everything hurts. Ah, there's water or something. Please. Please. Ah, I can't breathe. Ah, they're going to kill me. They're going to kill me, man. Ah, Americans became eyewitnesses to unchecked racial violence again. Floyd echoed the very words Eric Gardner said six years earlier, I can't breathe, and helplessly called out to his deceased mother. George Floyd's alleged crime? Using a counterfeit $20 bill. Floyd's killing was but one of a series of African-American killings within a few months of each other. And there have been more since. In response to his white friends asking if he was okay in this climate, Stanford University professor Brian Lowry said, the question I would pose to my white friends, are you okay? Are you okay after seeing a Minneapolis police officer casually pressing the life out of George Floyd? Are you okay after learning that police rushed in and shot Breonna Taylor a woman not accused of wrongdoing in her apartment. Are you okay after watching three men chase and kill Ahmaud Aubrey? Are you okay after watching an apparently liberal woman functionally weaponize her whiteness in Central Park? Maybe you believe the diverse activism on display nationwide will make things right. But sincere concern and time have not fixed our problems. They're not enough to protect any of us from the influence of a malignant system we all live in. The privileges of dominance come at a steep moral and psychological price for whites and cause others significant harm. And there we have it, white privilege. The mere mention of it causes many white Americans to either swarm in their own skins or launch into defensive denial, perhaps both. But privilege is the enemy of equality. The intent and clear result of one system of racial oppression being replaced by another for four centuries is white privilege. If we refuse to learn history's lessons, they repeat themselves. Over a half century ago, the Kerner Commission implicated white society as the cause of 150 racial uprisings. And as we now see a recurrence of the uprisings over racial injustice across the nation, history seems to be repeating itself. But this time, the uprisings are occurring in more cities and with more racially diverse participants. Across party lines, nearly 70% of Americans believe Floyd's killing represents a larger problem with law enforcement. If shocked Americans are asking themselves, how did we get here? After four centuries of systematic racial oppression, a better question to ask might be, how could we be anywhere else? If words enshrined in our seminal American documents like all men are created equal, established justice, and life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are to have any meaning, they must apply to all Americans. History has taught us that change will only come if all systems of racial oppression are methodically dismantled and we vigilantly prevent new systems from taking root, then maybe all Americans can finally breathe. Stay on freedom, hallelujah, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah.